Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, for the afternoon uh, session. Um, I have with me here uh, a panel of distinguished uh, uh, from the uh, uh, various companies and uh, regulators, and, and uh, I'm pretty sure that uh, having listened to the discussion from the ministers early on about the different challenges that we have, that uh, the panelists here will provide you with uh, uh, some perspective on 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 uh, or how to address some of the challenges they face. As some of you probably know, uh, well, well, sometimes we actually uh, think that. Uh, the approach to uh, some of these issues is that one one choose fits all, but in, in most cases, uh, one one choose fits some of us. So uh, I think with with uh, the the experience and, and the, the different uh, organization that these panelists actually represent, hopefully they will give you a, a, a fuller perspectives on on the challenges and how they approach how they address some of these challenges. Uh, I won't take up more time because you probably can, can see we have about uh, 10, 11 uh, panelists uh, and uh, similar to the earlier session, uh, each panelist will have three minutes and after, after uh, all the panelists and I'll open up the floor for questions from, uh, from the floor. Uh, given uh, if they, we have more time, then uh, I'll invite the panelists to comment further. But uh, given our, our limited time, I'd like to actually start off with uh, Mr. Adam Polus, Director of the United Nations Office for Disaster Risk Reduction. Adam. Hello? Okay, now it's working. Thank you. <clears throat> Mr. Deputy uh, Prime Minister, thank you for giving me the floor. And uh, thank you, uh, colleagues, for attending this session. Uh, distinguished ladies and gentlemen and excellencies, uh, all protocols observed. Um, it's perhaps a good thing to be the first in a session like this, um, and I hope I can introduce a few thoughts that I've heard in the last uh, day or so uh, to see if I can contribute. The uh, United Nations Office for Disaster Risk Reduction is the UN agency that is the custodian of the Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction, which carries from 2015 to 2030. Uh, we organized uh, with the gracious support of the government of Japan uh, the Sendai Conference in Sendai, Japan, March of last year. <clears throat> that was the first in the 2015 uh, Development Agenda conferences, followed by Financing for Development, and then the SDGs conference in September in New York, and then the COP21. Um, what's very clear is that disaster risk reduction uh, touches on all of those agendas. It's not an isolated set of activities, and I think we're seeing more and more of that uh, in the course of this conference. Um, let me thank um, the government of Kuwait for their support for this for this meeting and for their leadership in this uh, in this sector and in and in overseas development support. In fact, you know one of the good things of maybe it's just a bit of dumb luck, but um, yesterday there was a, a cover page article in the paper indicating the losses from the snowstorm in North America of about a billion in that one day. And then today I was you know fortunate to have yet another good quote that I can share with you today, which is that Kuwait in spending spree on development projects. The government stays the course despite oil slump and budget deficits. Kuwait, for those into trivia, is the largest per capita contributor to overseas development globally. Uh, so we are very fortunate to be in a country that is very generous and very giving. Um, as we start the post-2015 agenda, this is the very first meeting in 2016 that looks at these complex interlinkages between the development agendas, among the development agendas. Um, so we have certain drivers of global risk, poverty, inequality, climate change, rapid urbanization that are affecting our, our world. Uh, they're happening at a very rapid rate. At the same time, climate change and other adaptation measures are not uh, keeping pace, and so the complexities are, are mounting. If we look at uh, the losses in the built environment, that is in the sort of physical infrastructure losses, our own research in the global assessment report indicates some loss of 315 billion uh, annually in that built environment. Now, that doesn't take into account other issues related to agriculture and economic loss, but simply the one-to-one -one ratio of replacing a school that may have collapsed uh, in an earthquake, for example. So the numbers are enormous. And we hear lots of different discussions in the last day or two of, you know, what's the right ratio? A dollar spent here results in a savings of 
X dollars in the future. Those calculations are a bit complex because we're using some different mathematics, but the fact is that it's, it makes very, very good sense uh, to, to look at disaster risk reduction. And then, of course, for this conference, what is the role that ICTs might play in, in, uh, in mitigation? Um, there are a couple of things that I think I want to just put on the floor and, and, and uh, hope that they're of some use. The first is improving and understanding disaster risk. Um, in UNISDR, we uh, helped governments, uh, some 85 governments now, in creating disaster loss databases. These are very practical tools for governments to understand exactly what they've lost or could lose in the event of a natural disaster. And, you know, when we talk about all of government engagement, you know, we always want ministries of finance to hear these numbers and to hear uh, uh, how it is that a, a, a particular natural event is, uh, is, is impeding on other development agendas. Um, we also have the opportunities of investing in disaster risk reduction for resilience. So how can ICTs and other technological the science community uh, contribute to, uh, to making wise investments? And there again, we can look at some things like land use planning and other geospatial uh, uh, tools that's, that a number of colleagues in this room and even on the panel may speak to uh, that are of benefit to the disaster preparedness and disaster risk reduction agendas. Um, then we have the whole piece on access to vulnerable populations. We keep talking about rural populations, impoverished communities, uh, uh, communities that are perpetually in cycles of poverty because of natural disasters. Uh, being, being poor it doesn't, doesn't uh, um, uh, you're not immune to the impacts of disaster, but it's very hard to then crawl out of poverty on a repeated basis. Disabled communities. If you are physically disabled, you're six times more likely to uh, to be uh, more seriously affected uh, or even killed in a disaster than someone who might be able-bodied. Um, so these, these are important communities. Um, to put, again, some numbers into, into perspective, the, these are estimates that have come from UNCTAD, the United Nations uh, Commission on Trade and Development. The annual shortfall in investments for SDGs, the critical areas of SDGs, education, water, sanitation, is some 2.5 trillion. So we're talking enormous resources. Um, that means that managing disaster risk is actually a good thing from a purely economic standpoint. But I'll bring all of us back to the subheading of this, uh, this conference, which is saving lives. This is the business that we're in. <clears throat> to the extent that all of us contribute, can contribute to, to saving lives, then we've done something that we can all be proud of. Um, so with that, uh, Mr. Chairman, I'll, I'll end. I'll only uh, encourage uh, the colleagues on, on the panel and on the floor to see where we can make these linkages, uh, where the private sector and technological communities can work closely with international organizations, um, how governments can share information cross-border and with each other. You know, Mother Nature doesn't stop at a border. Mother Nature doesn't need a visa uh, when she wishes to come in with a cyclone. Uh, and we as a, as a community need to um, need to work together and be very clear in what our, our goals are, and we need to act now. This is one of the agendas across the, the global uh, spectrum that is actually understood and appreciated by everybody. So uh, with that, I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Adam. Um, now I'd like to uh, invite Christian Kao, Vice President, Marketing and Communication of Fourier for his intervention. Everybody else. Um. Soraya um, Telecommunications, uh, for those who may not know, we, we are through our, net, through our network, we cover Europe, Asia, uh, um, Africa, uh, and, and Australasia as well. Um, we provide handsets, broadband terminals on our own network. But our actual fundamental purpose, the, the reason we exist as a company, is to uh, save and improve lives. That, 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 that's what we do, that, that's what we want to do more of. So in looking at the role that ICT has to play in, in, in this area, uh, it's fundamental. It, 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 it's quite fair to say uh, that it can save lives, but it's certainly very true to say as well that it can save more and that we need to do more. The need is certainly there, as evidenced by the launch earlier this month of the OCHA a humanitarian affairs uh, report, uh, an event hosted in, in Dubai where Thraya has its head offices and indeed where we helped host the, the uh, widget, UN widget conference uh, last year too. There are a number of fundamental um, elements uh, 
uh, and areas of focus that we need to address if we are to ensure that we save and improve more lives than we are already. It's important first of all to address everything on a long-term basis. That's one of the reasons we signed the Crisis Connectivity Charter in Geneva in October. Um, because fundamentally readiness is all. The, the ability to be prepared, although as, as Adam rightly said, um, crisis uh, doesn't respect borders or visas, it also has an unpredictable travel plan. But we can be for sure for one thing, we know that crisis will strike again somewhere. There are obviously high risk countries identified and we can focus there too. But wherever help is needed, there are ways in which we can make sure that access uh, moves as swiftly as possible. We need to get our equipment in the right place, uh, in the right hands at the right time. That equipment needs to be made affordable to those people who need to use it and flexible price plans and, uh, and an ability to um, make sure that we're only charging when equipment is used, for example, is something that is, is, is easily remedied. We need to provide training and support for people. Our equipment, once you, once you know how to use it, is, is, is very reliable, it's very secure. Um, and we, we just need to make sure that in the right hands people are able to use it with confidence. There's a convergence of technologies required as we bring a, a raft of different solutions to a problem and a situation. Um, and uh, the ability to um, use our network and focus it where help is needed most in terms of dynamic resource allocation is also important too. Fundamentally, we need to ensure that equipment, back to the point about readiness, our equipment is tested, tested and tested again. It's ready, it's packaged, it's complete, so that if an antenna is needed, or a solar panel is needed, or cables are needed, they're there ready to go with our equipment too. That equipment should be used in drills and exercises. Search and rescue teams should know instantly how to use equipment that they will be using when they need to use it swiftly. So we need to integrate ICT into disaster management plans. Planning and preparation goes beyond that though. With early warning systems as they are, we also need mechanisms for delivery. Yes, we've saved people, but we've, we've watched an increasing frustration over the course of the last 12, 18, 24 months as migrants have suffered on board ships, overloaded, and we've not been able to find a mechanism to get the equipment that they need to them in time to save lives. That has to change. Pre-deployment systems are fundamentally vital. That is why the Tampere Convention is so, so integral to the long-term success of humanitarian um, activity uh, wherever and whenever it's needed. We need to override security concerns. We also need to streamline first responder protocol. So fundamentally, the equipment is there, it's been taken to parts of the world that need it most. It needs to be taken again, sadly, in the future, but when it does, let's please make sure that there's less bureaucracy and more willingness to, to arrive at speedy transfer of that equipment to where it's needed. Thank you. Thank you, Christian. Um, Christian raised a very important uh, I think it was raised early on in our ministerial discussion, especially about uh, getting the equipment closer uh, to where disaster might happen. I mean, like uh, in the case of Tonga, I had some discussion about um, we, we have outer islands, and then if there is a, a cyclone, it will take a couple of days before we can respond because the, the airport might be closed. There's no way we're going to take a ship down there. So if you have the equipment uh, pre positioned down there, then there's uh, that possibility that that might be of, of uh, great help, uh, especially in the first couple of days after a disaster. So uh, it would be uh, good to actually get the views of the panelists on, on, on uh, a similar kind of intervention. Uh, as, as earlier discussed in the ministerial, one of one of the um, one of the issues is actually identifying what role do organisations play. I mean, you don't want to duplicate each other's work. Uh, there's lack of coordination if you have all this with good intention want to help you uh, so it would be, uh, be very interested to hear what my, my next uh, panelist is going to say Mr. Jose Toscano the Director General of the International Telecommunication Satellite Organization 
Is that what I say? Uh, thank you, uh, Deputy Prime Minister. Good afternoon to all of you. Uh, let me start by thanking uh, ITU uh, for organizing this event and the Kuwaiti government and people uh, for having us here and serving as hosts uh, for the, uh, the event. Let me also uh, say that uh, I'm representing neither an operator nor a regulator. I represent the International Telecommunications Satellite Organization, which is an international organization, treaty-based organization with 149 member states uh, which is working in the area of satellites. Uh, when uh, I was asked to participate in this event, uh, I decided to prepare a full uh, PowerPoint presentation, uh, which uh, is available uh, on the website of the event, and which tries to identify uh, some aspects and some actions that we believe are crucial uh, for the theme uh, that uh, we are talking in this conference. Due to the time that was given to me, I will only stress some of these points, but please, I am uh, uh, at your disposal either to respond to specific questions on a one-to-one -one basis, if you so wish, or uh, after the event, uh, I am completely at your disposal. You will not be surprised uh, if I start by saying that, that ICTs play a crucial role against uh, natural disasters, uh, which are triggered either by climate change or humanitarian emergencies. ICT communications are vital for early warning systems, the immediate aftermath and recovery process of disasters, and agencies responsible for international disasters and humanitarian response must incorporate telecommunications ICT as a critical infrastructure for international disaster preparedness, response and recovery planning. What are we doing with our member states? What are the steps that we consider essential to establish communications for disaster mitigations? We, are, we have identified four steps that we work with our member states. The first one being risk identification. What do I mean? I mean that in order to reduce the impact of a future, a future disaster, it is important to identify and assess the risks a country is likely to face. That's one aspect that we invest very much with our member states. The second step relates, relates to reducing underlying risks. This can include, for instance, reinforcing critical facilities and developing land use zones. First step relates to preparedness and early warning systems. It is crucial in the that context that communities can be able to quickly and efficiently respond in the event of a disaster. It's something that we invest very much in with our member states. Firstly, and uh, finally, a first, a first step that we have identified relates to knowledge management and education. In fact, the promotion of risk awareness in vulnerable communities is an integral step in mitigating disaster risk and implementing risk reduction techniques. But for all of this to happen, there is one aspect that we consider ideal and where we invest very much uh, together with our member states, and that re relates to regulation. And enabling regulation is key. How can we do? What are the, the, the aspects of this enabling regulation? Firstly, we need to incorporate disaster risk reduction and disaster communications consideration into ICT development plans. We consider this to be crucial. Secondly, we must, we must adopt simple, transparent and non-discriminatory authorization procedures and licensing conditions for ICT services. I've come to the many cases where people who are willing to help complain about all the procedures, all the licensings, all the, 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 the problems that they have and they face in specific countries. Third, we must facilitate testing and type approval equipment requirements by recognizing foreigner type approvals. Fourthly, we have to develop procedures to efficiently address interface considerations and, and coordinate requirements when allocating spectrum. Fifth, we have to ease requirements for land rights or restrictions on use of specific ICT resources to maximize the number and kind of networks which are available. Six, we have to facilitate the transport the flow of end-user equipment. And finally, we have to cooperate with stakeholders in development of policy and regulations. One aspect of what we are doing 
is to work with our member states to incorporate some of same, if possible, all these principles in their ICT development plans. Let's now talk about infrastructure. Today, uh, we, we have a series of technologies that we can think of. We have fiber and submarine cable access. We have terrestrial microwave systems. We have satellite. Well, I'm representing a satellite organization, so do not be surprised when I say that satellite technology offers many advantages when it comes to emergency communications before, during, and after a disaster. During times of disaster, when other communication systems are either destroyed or overloaded, satellite communications equipment can be used immediately to support relief efforts. Ground infrastructure is often damaged and rendered useless during natural disasters and conflicts. Again, solution here and the response is satellite. During this morning, I believe the Minister of Zambia raised the question of the pricing of satellite services. I'm completely conscious of that, and that's why we worked very much with companies, satellite companies, Intelsat, that we are responsible to supervise, and other companies in the satellite arena, in order to uh, make sure that pricing is one which could be afforded by the majority of the countries. In our case, uh, we have pricing schemes which uh, are applicable to a certain number of countries and which uh, tries to make satellite communication affordable to those countries. But that's an area we are very much working, uh, working with our uh, member states and very much working with the satellite industry. What are then other specific aspects that we do as an international organization? Firstly, we ensure that Intelsat, which is the major satellite company, provides global connectivity and global coverage. We want to ensure that every country in the world has an infrastructure that can be used when necessary and when uh, needed. That's one of our roles. Intelsat has towards us specific obligations, and that's one of the things that we do. Secondly, we try to promote uh, the cooperation of the satellite industry. We uh, have been able uh, to do it, and we just recently signed an MOU between the uh, ITU, ourselves, and Intelsat, which will enable for free capacity to be available when necessary in specific countries or in countries where, where a disaster occurs. That's one area we invest very much. Thirdly, we participate in specific initiatives. We are partner in one of the ITU initiatives uh, for the Pacific Islands. That's an initiative which tries to connect ICT for development with ICT for emergency communications. The idea here is to have partner satellite uh, or industry partners which will make available resources to establish communication networks. In the case of the Pacific uh, Network, Pacific Islands Network, this is a network which will connect the islands of the Pacific. Capacity is being made available by Intelsat, equipment is made available by Inmarsat, and we invest very much on capacity building. Education, in my view, how to use equipment is something which is essential. We participate in this project. We are now discussing with the ITU a, a similar project for the Caribbean islands. And the fourth area I would like to mention is the area of capacity building. We consider capacity building to be essential and we have invested very much on this area. Uh, we do it through partnerships with the other international organizations. We, are, we have partnerships with the ITU, we have uh, partnerships with regional and other international organizations. We invest and fund at 100% the training or personal, the training of the people. Uh, one of the speakers, I believe it was this morning and, and today mentioned, okay, we don't have the equipment. But even if the equipment is there, if people don't know how, do not know how to use it, uh, what's the use? So we invest very much on educating. We invest very much on capacity building. This is one of the major aspects of our activity. Well, I think that I've gone over my three minutes. I will keep it uh, at this stage. Thank you very much for your attention. And I'm uh, at your disposal for any further questions. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Jose. Um, the, the initiative that uh, he mentioned about in the Pacific, uh, uh, we, we are 
part of the uh, we Tong is one of the beneficiary of that uh, initiative whereby we put some of the systems in uh, outer islands, uh, especially in schools, and they act as or like a backup to the telecom system. So if, if the telecom system goes down, we can always fall back on, on this particular system they have in place. So it, it uh, actually benefit not just on the social side, on the, the, the schools providing access to the internet and so forth, but also act as a backup system for uh, uh, in terms of disasters and so forth. So thank you, Jose. Now I'd like to invite Engineer Mustafa Al-Hafiz from the National Telecommunication Corporation and the Chair of the National Committee for Emergency Telecommunication of Sudan for his views. Hello. Yes. Uh, thank you, Excellency, for uh, this opportunity. I'm very glad to be here and uh, in this panel. And uh, I, I think now I'm, I'm going to change from the operators and vendors to to the regulators. Uh, I have to change to Arabic language. Please put on your headphones. Al Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillah. بالإضافة إلى الكوارث التي بيد ال بيد الإنسان يعني، فكانت هناك وسائل إنذار مختلفة في المستقبل في ال في ال في في الحاضر الآن تستخدم الوسائل السلكية والوسائل اللاسلكية بتجربتنا في السودان يعني هذه الوسائل عند الطارئ أو عند الطوارئ قد قد يحصل فيها إخفاقات وقد لا تعمل نسبة الاستخدام الكثيف وقد تؤثر عليها الطبيعة لو كانت فيضانات سيول في في إنه هذه الأشياء لا تعمل يمكن لذلك يعني رأت الوزارة الاتصالات وتكنولوجيا المعلومات تكوين لجنة معنية بالاستدامة الاتصالات أثناء الطوارئ هذه اللجنة تم تفعيلها في العام السابق وتضم في عضوتها المشغلين مشغلي الموبايل وتضم القوات النظامية وتضم آخرين من ذوي الخبرة فهذه اللجنة مهمتها استدامة الاتصالات أثناء الطوارئ والآن هي في طور وضع استراتيجية وخطة لكيفية التعامل لاستدامة الاتصالات أثناء هذا الطارئ في المستويات المختلفة حيث تم تقسيم الطوارئ إلى عدة أقسام بأحجام مختلفة بمستويات مختلفة أول هذه الوسائل هو التنسيق ما بين المشغلين نفسهم وذلك باستخدام التنويات المختلفة لو كانت الجوال القومي أو حتى استخدام شبكات الغير أو البنية التحتية للشبكات المختلفة وتبادلها وذلك أثناء الطوارئ فقط وحتى يتم استدامة الاتصالات في 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 في, في ذلك الحين. أيضا هنالك وسائل أخرى تعلمون في ال في نهاية العام السابق من خلال المؤتمر العالمي للاتصالات الرادوية تم تخصيص ترددات للبي بي دي آر. ولذلك درجنا في السودان من خلال هذه اللجنة 
في توفير الترددات اللازمة لاستخدامات البي بي دي آر وذلك كبديل للاتصالات في حالة إيقاف الاتصالات تماما لذلك نحن نرى أن استخدام النطاقات 700 ميجاهرتز أو 800 ميجاهرتز لاستخدامات البي بي دي آر هي واحدة من الأشياء البديلة في حالة توقف الاتصالات تماما في ذات المؤتمر تم منح الهوا ترددات جديدة في النطاق HF في رأينا هذا يتماشى مع الحوجة لاستخدام هذه الترددات في حالات الأزمات وحالات الطوارئ وفي حالة نقل المعلومات إلى العالم بصورة أسرع وصورة أرخص ونحن كدول نامية بنرى أن هذا النطاق من الأهمية بمكان لرخص أزعاره وإمكانية حمله فذلك يعطي أفضلية لهذا النطاق في استخدامات الطوارئ أيضا الأقمار الصناعية زي ما ذكر الأخوان لو كانت الثريا مارسات وغيره ولكن هذه بالنسبة للدول النامية قد تكون وسيلة مكلفة فنحن من هذا المجلس يعني تقديم هذه المشغلين هؤلاء المشغلين لخدمات رخيصة في حالات الطوارئ بالنسبة للدول النامية على الأقل اللجنة الآن تعمل بصورة جيدة وبصورة مثالية ويمكن في الأيام القليلة القادمة إن شاء الله سوف نستخرج خطة توضح طريقة عملنا خلال الطوارئ وشكرا جزيلا Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Hafiz. Um, uh, our next speaker is Mr. Mori uh, from Japan. Uh, before I give him the floor, I'd like to actually uh, uh, thank him. He was the chief uh, organizer of the ITU meeting on, on ICT indicators. And I think having, having those indicators is very important to, to actually measure the progress uh, of your development in relation to ICT. Um, so uh, with that, uh, Mr. Kiyoshi Mori, the Director General of Internal Affairs, Global ICT Strategy Bureau of the Ministry of Internal Affairs and Communication of Japan. Thank you, Chair. Assalamu alaikum. Firstly, as a Japanese, I thank the ITU, all member states, and private sector members for giving us so much assistance at a time of great earthquake which hit Japan five years ago. For example, the state of Kuwait provided us five million barrels of crude oil so many soccer balls, stationaries, and smiles. I would like to show you a good example of the ICT utilization at the time of the great earthquake. Key power plants and communication methods were totally damaged in the northeast of Japan. And it lasted for more than a week because of the continuous earthquakes after that. We could not get any information about which roads were not damaged and found severe difficulty in making appropriate rescue plans. One day after the great earthquake, a couple of automaker companies began to provide the probe data, which shows the actual places where each car was moving. Through dotting this data, we began to know which roads could be available. And then our government could make appropriate deliver plan of foods and goods to the affected areas. A couple of days later, a non-governmental -organ organization took initiative to make the common format of this data and made it open to the public so that drivers could get necessary information through their car navigation devices or through the internet. This method can be applied not only to developed countries, but also to developing countries. Japan cooperates with the ITU for the Ebola-related information sharing using this method. I would like to say that the advancement of the ICT would enhance the total quality of the disaster management drastically. In the near future, if each car can be equipped on board Wi-Fi base station, which provide on-site connectivity for mobile phone users, 
each card can be an information hub anytime, including the time of the disaster. I would like to discuss those kind of issues during the course of this forum. For the Sendai conference, about 6,500 people from 187 countries gathered and adapted the Sendai framework. I'm glad that the output in Sendai was really reflected to the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and the Paris Agreement of the COP21. And I'm really excited that GET 2016 is now being held right here to further strengthen these international frameworks. In that meaning, I really appreciate the great efforts by the ITU and the state of Kuwait to organize and host this conference. Thank you very much. Shukran Jajira. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Mori. Uh, I think that uh, it's very helpful in terms of uh, trying to keep to our time frame. Um, we, we have a number of panelists who couldn't actually make it here to uh, uh, most of them connecting flight via the US and you probably have heard or have seen uh, the, uh, the, the uh, snowstorm uh, uh, the currently in the US. Uh, so we, we uh, unfortunately we don't have here Tatiana Lawrence or, uh, or Moho Kendi from uh, Sierra Leone but uh, on the bright side we have here a new, uh, two new uh, panelists. And uh, with that, I'd like to uh, invite Pashmima Patel from Inmaset uh, for his intervention. Uh, Your Excellencies, uh, distinguished delegates, fellow Fang colleagues. Um, all protocols observed. Firstly, let me thank the uh, government of the state of Kuwait for their excellent hospitality. Um, IMASAT basically has been, uh, was founded in 1979 uh, through the United Nations by the IMO organization, the International Maritime Organization. And in fact, Kuwait um, and the Kuwait government was one of the founders of IMASAT. And they have been a leader ever since in terms of disaster communication, particularly for the maritime community. They were one of the first to have a, a gateway, IMASAT gateway. Uh, for rescue coordination uh, services. So we have a long term, uh, we've, we have a fairly long relationship with the state of Kuwait, uh, but in terms of providing IMASAT services. Um, IMASAT DNA is very much that of saving lives. It was founded on the basis of protecting, um, saving lives in the high seas. Uh, given the HF, the poor communication that vessels used to have, and having a, a global satellite, of, uh, a network of global satellites with 99.9% .9 network reliability today, 100% uh, redundancy in our satellite networks, with full global coverage. So we cover both uh, Indian Ocean, Atlantic Oceans, Pacific Oceans, uh, basically up to north and south in terms of 75 degrees in latitude. So fairly, a very extensive coverage globally. Uh, in terms of the network reliability, as I say, it's 99.9%, 100% redundancy in our satellites network. And basically, we have our products and services which are very much designed for critical communications. A vessel in high seas can press a button if it's in distress. And therefore, that aspect of it has been carried forward. Um, when I joined IMASAT uh, in the early 80s, 84, 85, when IMASAT was two, three years old, we then took the Global Maritime Distress and Safety Services forward into the aeronautical satellite communication. And again, we have safety services for aeronautical, for cockpit correspondence, as well as tracking of flights and so on today. So, we carry it from the high seas to the aeronautical community, and we also have it for the land community. And I think when we talk about, um, Deputy Prime Minister, when we talk about the, the disaster risk reduction and, and disaster management, we tend to, there are basically primarily three approaches. Cyclical approach we, we've been hearing about in terms of mitigation, which is critical, because every dollar invested in mitigation saves $10. Um, just to give an example of some documents I came across in the UN, which talked about 1 to 10 ratio. 
So mitigation preparedness is critical, uh, and then response and recovery. But if we've done the job well in mitigation and preparedness, then response uh, would be quite rapid, uh, therefore save more lives, uh, and, and recovery in, in terms of the rebuild of the infrastructure. So cyclical approach is one. Spatial approach, which basically goes down to the sum of the presentation that was given yesterday at local level. You can have a community where a base station can cover a certain geographical area. Similarly, today's satellite technology with its narrow beams, regional beams, global beams, can allow you to have that spatial approach as well. We have steerable beams as well to add more capacity if necessary and if required, particularly in crisis, war crisis, when you have war situation. So a spatial approach we at local, national, sub-regional, and regional level as well as global level and then you have the policy approach and the policy which really is governed by governments and institutional organizations in terms of standardization um, interoperability uh, and the management the institutional setup within within the government so take the three approaches and you can apply it to the the, the session that we're addressing today in terms of risk reduction Today's satellite technology is ubiquitous. We have equipment today for M2M, for SCADA, for mitigation and preparedness. So when we talk about tsunamis, when we talk about earthquakes, uh, when we talk about flooding, floodplains, um, any natural calamity or disaster that we anticipate can be monitored with fairly low cost networks. And we have put some of these networks in place today. So we are looking at hybrid solutions. We're not saying everything has to be satellite, but given the fact that satellite can provide extensive coverage, geographical coverage, national, regional, uh, and so on. So technology is there, hybrid technology, which allows you to have early warning systems, uh, whether we're looking at M2M or SCADA applications, very low data rate to high data rate services, whether we're looking at few hundred, hundred, uh, kilobits up to 50 megabits capability of solutions are there today and they're available and there are uh, mr. chairman here there are fairly low-cost solutions that can be put together the issues we have is also on the regulatory side I think that's been touched upon by my colleague from Thorea in terms of minimizing the bureaucracy uh, getting if we have got a disaster on our hand or crisis then let's get the equipment into the country. Therefore, there has to be minimal bureaucracy. There has to be almost open access to those areas of concern uh, in order to have that. Now, that, so regulatory aspects of it, Mr. Chairman, has to be dealt with, and we need to cover that aspect. Operational side, again, government have the institutional setup and command control network in order for us to work with the right agencies at the right level. Again, too many people, too many cooks, as we say, can spoil things. So therefore, let's minimize that and have a proper structure in places as part of the national uh, sort of national uh, disaster sort of management team, uh, where we can work with different government agencies, where we can work with other organizations, and can be more, much more effective in case of uh, response and recovery situation. In terms of disaster management itself, again, the satellite technology and equipment that we have, Mr. Chairman, is highly portable. It's, it's very flexible, it's rapid response, it's immediate. So let's work on mitigation and preparedness and prepare countries which have these calamities often and frequent can be addressed with solutions that are there, advanced warning systems, and then have, again, go on to the, the challenges of capacity building getting that technical expertise across to these communities at a local level. Um, I, I went to a, a situation where in Bangladesh, often every year, Bangladesh is hit with a lot of cyclones from the Indian Ocean. And every year you find the, the towers, the base stations, uh, terrestrial network collapse completely. Now they have bunkers, so they have a siren warning system which gets the people into the bunkers when the cyclone is before the cyclone hits. So there is an advanced warning system. They go inside the bunkers and in the bunkers they have satellite communication equipment. So once the cyclone is over, they have connection, they are informed the cyclone is over, they come out, they look at the damage 
and they actually then have the satellite communication where the local communities are actually trained on the equipment so that they're actually in touch with the right agencies and, and basically then food and uh, water and everything is provided to them. So there is a, an infrastructure that we can learn. There are a lot of best practices um, in various countries that we can actually benefit from as well that I think ought to come out in this, in this uh, conference as well, which we can then adapt and scale it to other countries as well. So Mr. Chevron, with that, there are challenges. We, we need to do look at the capacity building side of things, look at the technical expertise. Uh, there is the funding issue, of, of course, uh, which again can be addressed in terms of these kind of areas. But I, I believe the, the, we can overcome these various challenges as long as there's a will, there's a way that we can find a way forward to work with the, the various partners. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Patel. Um, uh, another who stepped in uh, because of the, the some unfortunate uh, uh, circumstances, some of our panelists is uh, Mr. Olivia Van Tam from UNITA, who was willing to share his views with us this afternoon. Thank you, Your Excellency, Mr. Chair. Good afternoon, everyone. So I'm very pleased to be here and thank you for ITU for the opportunity to, to join this panel and for the government of Kuwait for organizing this event. So a lot has already been said or today, this morning, now with uh, our fellow uh, uh, panelists. So, but I, I would like to share our humble experience in, uh, of my organization that will certainly give some resonance to, to what you've already heard. So I'm working with a UN uh, program called UNOSAT, who, which um, aims at uh, leveraging the satellite technologies and especially the uh, satellite imagery uh, to various fields of applications uh, and in support to different UN agencies, and among which disaster risk reduction is a, is a central part. Uh, so, UNOSAT is part of the UN Institute for Training and Research. So, these are two two important words in uh, in what we are doing and what we are discussing today. So, basically, we could be seen as a center of excellence within the UN to uh, in the use of uh, satellite uh, technology. So, maybe uh, what is GIS? Basically, everything on Earth has. Uh, geolocation. So we are using this geo-information technology to basically make better information. So the GIS is basically a software that allows you to superpose different level of information. Like, for example, we are talking about floods, but floods in the middle of uh, a plane with nobody in there is a uh, god gift, is not a, a disaster. It's when it comes to have people on in the same piece of land that it becomes a disaster. How you reach these people in, in need? So you need to, to know about the road network. So it's in basically superposing these different levels of information that you can come up with, uh, with analytics. So basically that's what we are doing uh, every day and in support to our member states and uh, also in partnership with uh, other UN agencies. So it's a very booming field. So basically, uh, when we talk about technology here, it's you, you almost cannot keep pace if you if you really want to be at the at the top. It's uh, very difficult. So um, we we are an applied research uh, program which aims at also supporting the colleagues with as much advanced solutions, but also at an affordable price and uh, that really. Uh, answer their, their requirements. It's not to have the most fancy things to just to have it. No, it's to have it to uh, support and, uh, and have a meaningful impact. So as we would like to, to, to mention few few of our activities and uh, important um, aspects. So you have more and more sources, more and more different type of satellites different uh, way of collecting information. You have uh, the power of uh, the crowd, what we, we can call. So basically, you don't, citizens are not anymore uh, 
a victim or an agent but they can also be become a part of the solution um, we developed a flood early warning systems basically a model that helps to to foresee some uh, the floods using uh, modeling technologies <coughs> that we can apply globally uh, at various scales of course the more you you work with the national authority the more you have data the more you can be precise and uh, and forward looking uh, the importance of uh, of resilience uh, basically after disaster to to build back build back smarter let's say so not just only we do the, the same mm. so and this knowledge we develop in the in the mapping field in uh, supporting the countries we also share it uh, via training it's not us delivering the the knowledge we share our experience but also we during the trainings as we are training professionals we we benefit very much from from their experience as well from what they have to say because it informs us uh, very much about what is needed when how come how we can even uh, uh, make a, a better a better work and uh, have a greater impact which is very important uh, during trainings so the importance of data sharing of course with different layers of data it's not rare that uh, even within a country you have uh, difficulties of sharing the, your data so at the international level well, it's uh, maybe understandable even if so some basics uh, should be shared naturally but sometimes even within countries the uh, ministry of transport have some data ministry of environment have some others and uh, ministry of interiors and all these sometimes are not really uh, in sync so it's very very important to to share all these uh, different uh, source of data so basically yes uh, i would finish on this is the the interconnections which are critical interconnections between the data sources between the uh, the different stakeholders, private sectors, government agencies, international organizations, which are all their, uh, uh, their value added and their uh, comparative advantage. And uh, how technology is, is a way to basically do, in doing, <coughs> in implementing using these tools, it's a, a way to concretely address the challenges which uh, have been raised uh, have been raised today and it's not for the sake of the technology it's really about the people that's the subtitles here it says it's what you do with it it's uh, like a, a hammer that you can destroy something or you can really build something uh, uh, which are I don't know statues so or something marvelous uh, piece of art so it's really harnessing the, the power of the technologies to, to, to for the people Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Olivia. I, I think that's a very uh, succinct uh, uh, example. Like, you know, uh, the ICT is basically a tool, and it's about how you use that tool uh, to actually mitigate uh, disasters and so forth. I think that's one of the important lessons. Uh, uh, my next speaker is Mr. David Gomez, Chairman of the Board. Uh, forgive me if I got this wrong. Agen uh, Agencia Nacional das Comunicados uh, from Cape Verde. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, <laughs> uh, Chairman. First of all, I want to ta take this opportunity to thanks uh, to thank ITU and the government of uh, Kuwait to give me this opportunity to to be here and share with you our experience uh, during. Uh, prevention and the reaction uh, in case of the measures. Of course, I'm coming from, I'm chairman from Regulator Board, this is National Authority of Communication of Cape Verde. This is why I want to share with you our experience in the first uh, time as regulator and the second as uh, entity who which uh, support the government of Cape Verde in the emergency situation. 
basically work, as I said, said, work in two fronts. The first one, in prevention. This is most important. And the second one, hope to be in the period situation of the really uh, emergency situation. As a regulator, work, we, are, we work in, we have two roles. The, f the first one is to establish uh, the rules and the fix uh, the parameters, technical parameters, uh, between different players and stakeholders. How they need to inter how to inter interconnect, how they uh, they can work during a, a emergency situation as separate network as so one single or unified communication. This is why uh, we establish, we fix, we prepare the national unified communication network that will be used during daily for police, for, uh, for different players uh, during daily, they're working, but during the emergency situation they can to be together and understand how to be read. This is a, uh, a, f a first role as regulator. The second moment, uh, as I told, I said, we support government to implementation, to implementation of the, the, uh, uh, to say, the implementation of the center of emergency situation. This is. Uh, which we support the uh, single national number of emergencies 112. Of course, during this process, it was very hard to put, to be in the same table with different uh, players, with, with different stakeholders, and we uh, planned and prepared the project, and now we are in the, pro in the process to implementation of this center, of the of the uh, emergency and the management of uh, uh, emergency situation. Uh, tomorrow, I think, tomorrow I will be, uh, present, uh, present this, uh, this case uh, in Cape Verde. But uh, what I want to say as a regulator is, is very important, is very important during the emergency situation to be with all operators, not, not as regulator to put in place the laws, the rules, but how to cooperate, as I said, uh, Mr. Toscano, how to cooperate and be ready to aid, to help uh, uh, each one. This is why in the last uh, volcano eruption, unfortunately, our national network, uh, emergency network is now is obsolete, you know, the technology is changing very, very quickly. But we work, we work it very well, as I say, with cooperation, not to, to see, to monitorize who is following very well the law. No, I can repeat, the cooperation in this situation of the emergency for me is very important. This is why we work it with the, all operators in the field to orient uh, the fundamental with what we we need this is a communication. This is what I can say you, uh, and thank you for your attention. Thank you, David. Um, the next speaker, um, in, in the Pacific, because we're a small island, uh, developing states, there are certain issues that we like to actually come together as a region to try and address. It. So it's, it's with interest that I, um, I introduce a new speaker, Mr. Abdul Karim uh, Somalia the Secretary General of the African Telecommunication Union on how they uh, approach it in the African region. Thank you. Thank you, Excellence. Uh, let me first, on behalf of the African Telecommunication Union, uh, my gratitude to the host country and uh, ITU itself and all those partners who are here today. So let me probably do like my friend, uh, Brother Mustafa, to switch another language because you know here as I do is a multiple language so let me speak in French just to at least to help our 
translator for French or interpreter to take a small break. Donc, je voulais juste dire que je voulais changer un peu pour quand même qu'on sache qu'il y a quand même d'autres langues aussi ici, comme le français. Et peut-être je voulais juste me dire que euh, l'Afrique, comme vous l'avez constaté, n'est pas un continent, comme on dit, qui connaît les autres catastrophes naturelles comme les autres continents. Mais cependant, nous avons une autre, comme on dit, catastrophe qui peut-être probablement est plus compliquée que les catastrophes naturelles qui sont ce qu'on appelle les épidémies. Vous avez ce qu'on appelle l'épidémie de, de, de choléra, l'épidémie de, 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 de Ebola, et puis aussi parmi tant d'autres. Donc, du point de vue euh, euh, arsenal juridique, au début, les pays africains n'étaient pas préparés pour tout ce qui concerne les, les communications d'urgence, parce qu'on était épargnés. Cependant, aujourd'hui, grâce au TIC, on a vu que nous pouvons lutter sur une autre forme de, de, de catastrophe, qui sont les, les épidémies. Et je pense que l'UIT a eu à intervenir pour résoudre ou aider des pays comme le Sierra Leone en matière de, de lutte contre Ebola pour savoir un peu comment souscrire. Je pense aujourd'hui c'est une autre opportunité pour nous autres pays africains de voir comment nous allons utiliser l'éthique pour pouvoir lutter contre surtout ce qu'on appelle les épidémies de l'homme, mais aussi, aussi les épidémies comme on appelle aussi d'autres qui s'appellent les épidémies de, de la nature, comme les criquets ou autres. Là, il fallait créer un système, je crois, applicatif qui va informer les leaders politiques pour les dire « Attention, dans telle zone, vous avez telle épidémie qui se manifeste, dans telle zone, vous avez telle épidémie. Que... » Surtout dans un continent où vous avez des moyens de transport, mais aussi, certainement, je vais revenir aux préoccupations de la Zambie qui avait posé justement le problème de, de l'accessibilité. Parce que jusqu'à présent aussi, il faut dire que nous n'avons pas encore la couverture totale pour que nous pouvons informer les autorités de tout ce qui se passe dans chaque village euh, au niveau africain parce que les gens n'ont pas encore les moyens de communication. Jusqu'à présent, je pense que c'est aussi un autre problème pour nous. Avant même de passer à, aux applicatifs, il faut certainement que nous assurons la couverture totale de nos territoires. Je pense que c'est très important. Et sur ce point-là, je, je, je suis d'accord avec euh, mes amis de Immersat et de, de, de ITSO pour dire que nous, nous avons encore d'autres moyens de communication. Et c'est pour ça qu'à la dernière conférence de l'UIT, nous avons insisté à ce qui est suffisamment euh, de spectrum pour toutes les technologies parce que nous, étant un continent très vaste, nous ne pouvons pas toujours euh, nous dire que nous allons focaliser et, et, et l'accès au TIC sur une telle technologie, comme on dit la fibre optique, l'Afrique est tellement vaste que nous ne pouvons pas tirer le câble partout. Mais toujours est-il que nous pouvons utiliser d'autres moyens de communication complémentaires comme les satellites. Maintenant, je ne peux pas peut-être euh, satisfaire la demande de son excellence concernant la réduction des coûts de communication par satellite. Cependant, euh, notre rôle au niveau de l'Union africaine, c'est surtout de... de, de renforcer la capacité de nos membres et maintenant quitte à eux de savoir comment discuter, comment négocier avec les différents partenaires pour trouver, comme on dit, le bon coup. Et je pense que la libération aussi va contribuer à ce sens-là. Je pense que les opérateurs télécoms aussi sont invités à négocier davantage pour qu'on ait les coûts, comme on dit, les plus accessibles et puis les plus favorables aux consommateurs africains. Donc je pense que pour nous, l'éthique aujourd'hui, c'est vraiment un, un levier très important pour pouvoir en tout cas asseoir notre politique de lutte contre ce qu'on appelle dans le jargon français la lutte contre les grandes endémies. Je pense que c'est très important pour nous en tant que pays africain d'utiliser cette éthique. J'ai même vu un exemple très important tout à l'heure avec le Burundi, je crois avec certains partenaires comme l'UNICEF et autres, là ils ont créé en tout cas une plateforme pour tout le monde, pour pouvoir informer rapidement euh, les centres de soins de santé, ou pouvoir aussi informer le, 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 les villageois pour les dire « attention, demain c'est la campagne de sensibilisation, demain la campagne de vaccination va commencer, il faut que la femme au village puisse amener son enfant au centre de vaccination le plus proche du corps, que pour nous, ce sont ces applicatifs » que nous pouvons utiliser en tout cas au niveau d'éthique pour pouvoir euh, davantage, comme on dit, et, et, et faire en sorte que la santé de nos concitoyens soit en tout cas le plus protégée. Donc je pense que euh, 
comme j'ai utilisé, comme on dit, la langue de Molière, j'ai parlé peut-être un peu plus vite et peut-être je veux, je veux m'arrêter là pour remercier davantage de tous les pays. Je crois qu'aujourd'hui, les pays africains sont suffisamment présentés ici pour pouvoir, en tout cas, partager et puis surtout prendre l'expérience des autres pays pour pouvoir implémenter ces différentes stratégies au niveau, comme on dit, et local, mais aussi régional, parce que l'Afrique aussi, comme vous savez, c'est un grand continent. Nous avons beaucoup d'institutions sous-régionales qui luttent, comme on dit, euh, euh, par rapport à tout ce qui concerne, en tout cas, l'intégration, le partenariat. Donc, euh, merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Mr. Sumaira. Uh, our next speaker is Mr. Ellen Kosovich, uh, Vice President Engineering of CES Tech. Thank you. Your Excellency, good afternoon, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you for your invitation here. I would like to give a short example of the uh, role of the ICT in the disaster response and uh, preparedness through the project called Emergency.lu. Emergency.lu is the actually the project with the scope to establish the broadband connectivity in very early hours after the disaster strikes. Today, Emergency Waterloo is offered as a free public good by the Luxembourg government to the humanitarian workers and humanitarian organizations around the world. It's a worldwide system available as a 24 by 7 uh, to be deployed in any part of the world at any point in time. So it all actually started in January 2010 with the Haiti earthquake, as I already mentioned, one of the most devastating disasters in the recent past, the recent five years, when several hundreds of lives were taken. Uh, and it also was uh, one of the biggest response of the humanitarian communities uh, at that time so far. Uh, however, that also created a problem of coordination in the field. And one of the teams that was sent to the Haiti at that point in time was also Luxembourg Beach Search and Rescue Team, which ended up actually uh, being on the site very early, but uh, not being able to support and help in the situation because absolutely no communication and no coordination in the field for the very few hours, first hours of first days of disaster. So they came back basically to Luxembourg and um, they said, okay, like Luxembourg is one of the major donors uh, in terms of GDP uh, donations and per, per capita, basically uh, says there must be something that we can do to actually save the lives at these early hours of disaster and the most lives actually can be saved. So we sit uh, as a company, private company as yes, uh, and two other companies, Hightech and Luxembourg Ambulance with the Luxembourg government and see actually what we can do to actually provide a broadband connectivity in the early hours of disaster. Something that can be predictable, repeatable and sustainable, something that you can actually rely on in the disasters to come. Um, it, uh, very soon became obvious that uh, technology definitely helps. Uh, there are definitely technology solutions that uh, we can propose there, especially from the, as a satellite operator, satellite connectivity, as I mentioned earlier by the colleague in the panel, is the technology of choice to provide the connectivity in the case of disaster. But very soon became obvious that technology is not the only one, that we need actually to look at the holistic pictures, the holistic picture of uh, handling disaster communication in such a distressed situation. That also requires basically logistics, requires the establishment and availability of the resources, uh, satellite capacity, equipment in the field, uh, availability of the people who actually trained to operate equipment, as well as not only communication uh, means, but also the IT applications that will help people to report back and uh, organize the help to come in the next days. Uh, as a result of that, we also reach out for other partners, and especially there I have to say that uh, we find an extremely good cooperation and partnership with the WFP, the World Food Program, as the leader of the Emergency Telecom Cluster, with which we set together and actually defined what Emergency Hotel is and is gonna, going to be. As a result, after the, let's say, almost a year of work, um, we came up with a system that can be deployed at any point in time in the world. It's available 24 by 7. Uh, relatively easily be transportable as an airline basically compatible uh, luggage and is uh, logistically organized in the way that is pre-positioned around the world in the, in the major humanitarian hubs as well as the people are trained uh, at multiple levels at the UN level, at the civil protection level of Luxembourg, of Germany, of Belgium, of Sweden that can actually go and take this equipment and deploy everywhere in the world. So 
the system is actually developed as a private-public partnership between Latvian government and Republic companies, which I have to stress out is actually a model that I think works very well in the situations like uh, disaster response because it takes both uh, let's say benefits from the public sector of providing technology and resources uh, as well as uh, private sector sorry uh, private sector to pro provide the technology resources and public sector to provide the connectivity or uh, necessary means to actually intervene in the other in the other countries uh, response uh, capabilities uh, here i would say uh, if i can conclude this uh, it's not all about technology, it's also about the people. It's about being prepared, being logistically ready, being, uh, being uh, able to provide sustainable and uh, repeatable solution uh, for that can be relied on for the years to come. Emergency Hotel is actually first time deployed 1st of 10th of January 2012 in South Sudan, and since then has been actually deployed as a first system of response in any, any single disaster you've heard over the last three, four years basically being Philippines, being Nepal, being the Ebola crisis, everywhere you heard about the, about the emergency, uh, emergency of the law has been, has been deployed. Now, of course, the next, uh, the next challenge here is uh, sustainability and how you make this uh, system sustainable. Of course, due to the number of resources being blocked in order to wait for the emergency, it makes sense, of course, to bundle such a project with the development projects and make sure that the resources are used in the time there is no emergency for development activities. As such, we embarked also on the project to actually use emergency.lu network in the times of no disaster for the e-health system and support uh, developing countries in uh, enhancing uh, health infrastructure for the, uh, for the development activities. Thank you. Thank you, Alan, and I look forward to actually having a discussion on, on how to actually use it in the Pacific. Um, my next speaker is Mr. Timothy Allen, uh, who's the president of the International Amateur Radio Union. Uh, I mean, in the Pacific, and I'm sure in all, most of the developing countries, radio is still one of the key tools about educating, about warning people, about informing them uh, about uh, disasters. Uh, so uh, uh, with that, I, uh, uh, Mr. Timothy Allen. Th thank you very much. Uh, um, uh, let me add my welcome and, and my thanks to uh, the government of the state of Kuwait and the International Telecommunications Union for organizing this conference. It's very important and it's good to see that we have so much interest in it. Um, I represent the International Amateur Radio Union and we represent the interests of the amateur radio services at the international and regional level and we're made up of about 160 member societies around the world, and one of which I'm very proud to say is the Kuwait Amateur Radio Society, who is very active, not only in this country, but in, in the region, and is uh, very supportive of our efforts. I was lucky enough to be a speaker at the first conference uh, back in 2007, and I was asked then, what are the uh, benefits for the, of the amateur radio services in emergency communications? And I'll repeat them here because they're as true today as they were uh, several years ago, even with the advances in other communications tools that are available to the public. And there's three points. The first is amateur radio operators are on the ground. If they're not close to the uh, site of a uh, disaster, they might even be in it. They're there. They're ready to go. So in the first critical 24 to 48 hours, you have people on the ground ready to assist. Uh, second, they own their own equipment. We don't rely on commercial networks. If, if a cellular service goes down, we can, uh, we can uh, assist by using HF or VHF or UHF communications on a peer-to-peer -peer basis. Uh, we don't rely on, on commercial uh, services. And the third is knowledge. Uh, I like to say, you know, I'm, I'm not an engineer. I don't work in the communications field but I'm an amateur radio operator and I know enough to be able to, in a time of crisis, to put my radio on the air by using alternate power sources and, uh, or, and, and building a very simple wire antenna. So you have these skilled people on the ground, they know what to do, they know what, what bands and frequencies to use to be able to assist in times of, uh, times of disaster. Now, there are issues 
which face all amateur radio operators, and I'll highlight them here, because I think it's something that all countries can work on in improving. Uh, there are three of them as well. Uh, first is the tax on equipment. Amateur radio operators buy their own equipment, and in some countries it's very heavily taxed. And in our view, anything you can do to relieve tax on amateur radio equipment is certainly to, to, to our benefit. Secondly, there are licensing restrictions in some countries. Uh, some countries uh, uh, have very uh, limited ability to, to actually hold exams and allow people to get their individual amateur radio licenses. Anything that can be done to streamline the ability of individuals to, to help out and, and, and become active in the amateur radio services would be very helpful. And third is um, the uh, support structures. Uh, amateurs use radio, and uh, whether it's on HF or VHF, they need to use uh, towers and other support structures to uh, put up their uh, antennas, often in an urban environment. Um, and in, again, in some countries, there are restrictions on uh, the ability of amateurs to put up support structures. So anything that can be done to allow amateur radio operators to uh, put up effective uh, communications uh, facilities for HF and VHF would be of assistance. Um, the amateur radio service is, is very proud uh, to be able to partner with uh, a number of entities and, and the ITU in dealing with emergency communications. We've been around for uh, 100 years, and we're going to continue to be around for the next 100. There are a number of uh, new technologies which amateurs have developed, which uh, are very helpful in, in emergency communications. So my message to you is, don't forget the amateur radio services. They're a, a, a great uh, asset to many of you, many of the countries, and many of the uh, organizations in the times of crisis. Thank you. Thank you very much, and, and uh, thank you, uh, Timothy. And that brings to a close the first part of our panel discussion this afternoon. And with that, I'd like to open the floor. Uh, if you have any uh, burning questions, please raise your name plates uh, and, and limit your question to uh, at most one minute. Uh, so, uh, if you if you're addressing a specific uh, uh, panelists, please uh, uh, let us know. But if not, then I'll just uh, uh, open it up for the panel to respond. Yes, Minister. Uh, well, Jim, Minister, we're, we're trying to find a microphone. Well, while we're waiting, maybe we can take another question while we, we, we get the microphone. Is there another question that we can address while we're sorting out this communication disaster? Hello, I, I, I was saying I'm one of the people who had forgotten um, about uh, amateur radios, and I don't think I'm the only one. Could they be, as we search, uh, coming from the context of a developing country, as we search for very easy, effective uh, methods of communication during disasters, could there be a reason why there has been a lull on amateur radios in terms of uh, their knowledge that they're there? They're good. Timothy? Thank you, uh, thank you Minister. Uh, um, you know, amateur radio is still very, very useful. Um, and, and we do what we can to encourage individuals to obtain the qualifications necessary to, to uh, have the license and to be able to assist in, in emergency communications. Uh, but there are challenges that, that we face, and, and one of them are uh, some issues on trying to get individuals licensed and, uh, and whatever can be done to streamline the licensing process in some countries, in some regions they have uh, common examinations for example. Um, 
uh, and, and many people know in 2003 the Morse code requirement ceased to be um, uh, a requirement for amateur radio operators. So there are steps being taken to try and keep uh, uh, and, and license more amateurs uh, to assist in emergency communications. Does that answer your, your question? Yeah. Thank you. Questions? I have to say I'm very, uh, you know, very happy that um, still a number of you are actually still here after an hour, especially after lunch. And, and I, I forgot to mention is actually I see that, uh, that that lunch that you hosted uh, uh, was very nice. You know, and, and it was very unfortunate for me that I actually have to be here as a moderator again. Uh, so again, the floor is open for any question to any of the panelists. While we're waiting for questions, uh, if any member of the panelists want to add uh, some short intervention, yes. Thank you, Prime Minister. Um, I just wanted to add, actually, to the amateur radio, uh, Timothy, that we, we have technologies which developed. I mentioned hybrid technologies earlier, and, and we have a solution where we actually take a, a VHF and a UHF radio, and we actually then convert that into L-band frequencies. So we have a little converter, uh, size of a typical uh, power supply you have for a laptop. And that converts the signal from VHF to L-band. And with a, a cup size antenna, you can actually go to the satellite and connect to another radio amateur person who could be very far away, not in the local community. Because amateur radio is restricted to the coverage with VHF or, or whatever other alternative frequencies you have, local, local based frequencies and, and so on. So we, you can actually use, complement it with a satellite converter and go long range through an L-band satellite uh, to depend upon the footprint, of course, um, within the region as such. So you can broaden the coverage. It's a, it's a wide area coverage. We have, as I said earlier, we have narrow beams uh, regional beams and global beams. So, um, if you happen to have a, you know, uh, an amateur radio which which wants to broaden his coverage footprint, if you like, uh, using a satellite technology, then there are hybrid solutions that are available. You know, that that's a, an example, a perfect example of how amateurs can work uh, with many people in this room. Uh, to provide effective communications in the first immediate uh, hours after a disaster. And I should add, as a plug, um, amateurs are very good at developing new technologies. Uh, Joe Taylor, who's a Nobel laureate uh, and also an amateur, developed a very uh, good weak signal propagation software, which he makes freely available. And that allows uh, communications at very low uh, sub one watt power levels on HF and VHF frequencies. So. Again, an example of how people and uh, amateurs can cooperate with, with uh, commercial services. Thank you. In the interest of time, I'll take uh, at most two more questions. Yes. Um, my question for the uh, Mr. Mori from Japan. Uh, uh, we noticed from satellite images after uh, latest tsunami that some urban area nearly demolished. Okay, I would like to know the role of geospatial data remote sensing, GIS and ICT, especially after disaster. Okay, thank you. You mean remote sensing or phones? Yes, uh, we endeavored to ev make every usage of every ICT tools. And for the first week or two weeks, satellite was very useful. And amateur radio was also very useful. And as I explained, uh, within two or three weeks, uh, automobile companies and IC companies and our government made the best effort uh, to create the atmosphere for your mobile phones or, or other methods can be used. And we really realized three S policies are very important. Seamless, secure, and smart. Yes, seamless aims at creating seamless conditions in terms of time and space and among different institutions. And secure means enhancing resilience of communication methods, infrastructure. And smart means utilizing 
cutting edge ICT technologies. Yes, we did those kind of things. If I can just add, uh, uh, in, in a smaller, very smaller scale level, in a small island of states like Tonga, after the, the Category 5 cyclone in Tonga in 2014, uh, one of the tools that we use is remote sensing, whereby we actually take uh, you know, an image straight after the cyclone, and we use that to actually assess the damage, because you have a before and after image. So that was very helpful in our case to actually assess the damages of that particular cyclone. So I guess that to some extent, if you're a small island state, there can be some of your tools in terms of uh, damage assessment. So, yes. Uh, we'll yes, thank you, Mr. Chair, because working for a program you who use this every day, I would like to, to add that, uh, again, preparedness is very important because, okay, you can do the damage assessment with the, one of the, the main uh, aspect of using remote sensing, but you need to, to be equipped, you need to know where to, to find the image, or at least who can provide you with the analysis, with the analysis. And also, you can go in deeper into the analysis if you know, okay, this building has been destroyed, but is this building a private house, a hospital, a school? It changes the, the, the totally the critical info, the information and and how you're gonna react to, to this information and how you are going to use it. So preparing baseline data is very uh, upstream is very important. So when the crisis uh, occurs, you you can uh, you can be very much uh, more reactive. So in terms of applications. You have damage assessments, but you have also uh, extent of the damage, in, depending also on what it is. Uh, access roads, how you access the estimation first of people in, in affected, then how you reach them, asset, and then longer. Uh, don't know, uh, these are very first uh, information you you seek with these tools, given the fact that you can get them because sometimes it's cloudy, you cannot and so on, so you have different uh, limitations as well. But uh, and then damage assessment and monitoring the recovery and uh, and you have many different types of applications uh, uh, you can use for, for with, uh, with these tools. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, yes. Regarding using including the database and the, uh, the GIS systems, do you have uh, an instantaneous uh, system that give you a live uh, information? Thank you. Live information about what's going on on the yes, ground? Yes, yes. Uh, well, um, you can get first insight in, in within a day or two. Um, and uh, so it's not live. Satellites are taking pictures when they are rotating in orbit, so they are not streaming videos. Some starts to do, but the resolution is low. But in any way, it will pass over, and so it, you get a snapshot at a specific time and a specific place. So you cannot monitor in a sense that, okay, you have a, you see what's going on really. But with the multiplication of the source and the different types of uh, satellite sensors, it can be radar, it can be optical. So um, combining again all these sources of information uh, makes uh, and having being prepared upstream makes you able to to provide very good insights on situational awareness to decision makers. That's, really really what matters so it's not live but uh, it's Sorry, it no. can provide you with uh, quite good uh, understanding of uh, what's happened excellencies ministers uh, ladies and gentlemen uh, because of time constraint and uh, due consideration to our interpreters uh, i i would like to actually close that part of the of the session um, and i uh, like to join me in actually uh, thanking our, our panelists uh, for their very interesting, diverse views, uh, especially from different stakeholders on, on uh, addressing uh, disaster risk reduction and saving lives. So please.